Can I ask them one question and then we'll dive in? Yeah. So I'm just sort of curious. I learned so much from this film. First of all, thank you for making this film. Thank it's you. sobering and alarming and kind of depressing, but also kind of motivating, right? Um, okay, how many people have gone down a YouTube rabbit hole? <laughs> okay, almost everybody. Okay, okay, here's the fun question. What is the longest time you've been gone down a YouTube rabbit hole? Anyone know? Three hours? Six hours. Okay, do I hear, like an auction, do I hear higher than six hours? <laughs> okay, six hours, that's, that's an intense rabbit hole. <laughs> oh yes, of course, well that's totally understandable. Okay, thank you for that. So Alex, um, uh, I left my questions up there. Would you mind just bringing down those papers? Thank you. But um, so you've made a number of films about technology and the disruptive nature of technology, about Napster, about Bitcoin, Smosh, who I didn't know about until I saw your film. Yep. <laughs> um, so why, thank you so much, YouTube. Why YouTube? Why now? Um, well, uh, I mean, I've mostly... I'm an older fella, so I came up on uh, online before the web um, in the 80s. I probably first got online in about 83, 84, um, which was dial-up. It was what was called the BBS era, uh, Usenet era, all text-based. And what captivated me about the Internet then um, was the, uh, the community that existed already uh, that was there was a very interesting group of people. And uh, it's very similar to what we find on YouTube and in other communities online now, especially like Discord and sort of all the fractured off communities that you now find that where you can make your own server and kind of wall yourself into your own siloed community. Um, it was much smaller. You had thousands of people, maybe five, maybe 10,000 at most. Um, but it was politics and art and f pretty radical stuff, some dangerous stuff, some criminal stuff, some encrypted stuff. Uh, but it was community. And there was also a lot of outreach going on then. And this was the 80s. There was a lot of, of people, because you could be anonymous on the internet at that time. So you could find other people or you could connect with people in different areas of uh, whatever your issues or your challenges might be, the way a lot of people are finding community online now. Um, but it was evident to me in those early days that this was going to completely change. It was the first time human beings in different parts of the world were in a kind of democratized space. And uh, so my first documentary was about Napster, which interested me. Do you guys know what Napster is? Are you old enough? Not even, right? A little bit. Okay, Napster was thought of as, and I'll keep this short because we have a lot to talk about. It was, it was a thought of as a file sharing a software. Um, what Napster was, was 100 million simultaneous users on one central database for the first time in human history. It was the biggest, most disruptive global internet-based community that had ever existed up till that time by an order of magnitude. It kind of was like the YouTube of the late 90s, much more than what people think about Napster as now, which was a way to steal music. Uh, which was largely, don't get me started, it was largely propaganda that was be being created by the record industry because they were terrified of Napster. But uh, Napster was first and foremost a community. So uh, YouTube is now by far the largest global community online on the planet. But now the numbers are crazy, right? Now, I mean, Napster was 100 million simultaneous users during dial-up. Napster was the reason broadband internet was created. Broadband was created because universities and institutions were going down because they couldn't support the, the web traffic. And that's how broadband got pushed through. So uh, YouTube is now, I think it's probably hosting 4.6 or to 8 billion video views a day, right? And that, like, that makes TikTok is like that in comparison. Like almost all you, these other platforms that you guys are on are teeny weeny in comparison to that number. Uh, so that's why now, like, like, what do you, what are the social implications of a media platform that is bigger than any other media platform on the planet that isn't really a social media company as much as all of your news, all of your search, all of your film, your music, your television, 
all of your interconnectivity with your friends, then you've got DIY, then you've got influencers, influencers, then there's some aspect of social media there, but not much. Uh, what is that animal, and what are the implications of that on, on the planet? That was sort of like the why now. And then when we started, as I said at the beginning, COVID erupted like a month after we started, and that really uh, kind of gave us a guidepost for what the film was going to cover because YouTube was so had such an impact on all of the events of 2020. So, okay, and you guys, I'm gonna ask a couple more questions, then we'll open it up, okay? And then we'll make it really interactive. So you've talked about the unrivaled scale. Why is the, I mean, it's, it's incomprehensible. I can't wrap my head around the billions of users and views. So why is that a concern? Why is it important? Why is it a concern? Because the, the influence of the, the type of content that is on YouTube is, the other thing that YouTube has, which I didn't mention, is it's a repository for basically all of recorded human history. Um, it is, it's essentially our library Alexandria. It is every conceivable piece of recorded media that has ever existed can be found on YouTube. And, and I feel like we saw a lot of it and in our film. And there's a lot of it in our film. Um, uh, and th then the, the important piece of this is, is business um, and not really algorithmic, which is, YouTube is an ad-based platform, right? So its money is derived, and it makes a lot of money, is derived by the interaction of the user with the content and monetizing that content and uh, with ad revenue. So they are incentivized to keep you on platform regardless of the factual veracity of the content. In fact, it may make them more money to feed you non-facts. It may make them more money to feed you propaganda. Um, in fact, that's being you know, coy because it does make them more money to do those things. Uh, so that's why it matters because they are, they are and there's, they do an enormous amount of good and we're on the platform all the time and my kids are on it all the time and I use it in my work all the time and I like a lot of people at Google and at YouTube quite a bit, but it is inarguable that they are monetizing propaganda and causing real world harm. Uh, just simply by virtue of the scale and the business model. And, and then it's a monopoly. Well, Google owns YouTube and Google is a monopoly, yeah. So there's no, there's no meaningful regulation, there's no guardrails, there's no litigation, there's no, and there's a antitrust law being floated at Google right now that was actually, came up under the Trump era, believe it or not, uh, in 2020 and is now going, to making its way to the court. Uh, but that's mostly about antitrust to do with business competition. It doesn't really get into harm, which I think is what we need to dig into a little more. So, okay, so uh, a couple more of my questions. So IndieWire headlined an interview with you, and it was titled, How YouTube Caused the Hollywood Strikes. I can't help it. I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> I have to ask that question. <laughs> um, how? How? Okay, well, I mean, they're, you know, they're being a little clickbaity, because I don't think I said that exactly. <laughs> but, um, but the fact is, is that we are... What the film is really about at the end of the day is kind of this inflection point we're at, where you know, the, the world that you all are about to march into, um, we've, we've all faced challenges, like every generation faced challenges, we did too. Um, uh, but the challenge that, that you guys are gonna face is coming into this kind of post-truth world, right? Where it's, it's harder to, to argue what is or isn't a fact at a very critical time in terms of what's going on with climate, in terms of what's going on with the rise of big tech, and the monopoly power of big tech, uh, and in terms of the harm, some of the harms that can be caused that are that are very real world harms. So uh, where that's showing itself right now is in labor, and I'm sure uh, because some of you are journalists, and even if you're not, it, you know the Hollywood is striking, but but the Hollywood strike is just a tiny little piece of a much bigger labor crisis that's going on around the, the world right now. In fact. Uh, even our union has had solidarity. We have Teamsters who are in the film business, as you know, and we had solidarity with the, the Teamsters fight with UPS that was gonna potentially strike. Um, there's a, you know, there are pe people at Starbucks trying to strike. There are people at Google who are trying to unionize and got fired, actually within the AI department yeah, just a couple of weeks ago. Good luck with that. Yeah, so, so this, is a, this is a global labor crisis, and it's largely being uh, prompted by uh, the sort of rise of, of inequality due to the concentration of wealth amongst a handful of oligarchs, uh, many of those are, are tech oligarchs. And so there's a, uh, 
a problem that we face right now with the ability to fight those oligarchs in court and create meaningful anti-monopoly law or, or antitrust law or just basic safeguards and regulations because uh, they have enormous lobbying power and they have the ability to keep the government and citizens off their back and, and act with impunity and they don't really care about the workforce so much. So it's this kind of uberfication of the workforce where everyone gets turned into a, a gig worker and you don't have benefits, and you don't have health care and you can't make a, a living wage. Um, and that is directly related to um, the business model uh, that most of the big tech companies have. Okay, yeah, this is, we're just coming out of the, the what's the hot labor summer, right? Yeah, well, and it's yeah. still, got, I mean, we're going into, into cool labor autumn. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. strike is not ending anytime soon, but probably won't end this year. So, so before we segue into systemic, you know, policy, and, and this is a, sponsored by the Center for Leadership and Communication Leadership and Policy, right? Yeah. So, but I have a personal question to ask. Is there a way to game the algorithm? Like, the way they talk about the algorithm, it's like it's its own sentience, right? Yeah. I'm talking to, like, it's, it's, I enjoy talking to younger people because they're so much smarter about tech stuff than, than my generation is. But I, I don't think you need to game the algorithm anymore. I mean, I think maybe with TikTok, TikTok's algorithm is a hot mess. And um, that's its own problem. And it's not what we made our film about. But it is, it is a runaway train of chaos. Um, uh, and I think that's more benign in a way. Well, it's right. not benign. There's a lot of really terrible, like alt-right, hate-filled, nasty, anti-trans, crazy stuff going on on TikTok. But, um, but it has a lot less people watching it than YouTube, uh, and it monetizes in a very different way. Uh, but it, it's not to say <laughs> that people shouldn't be dealing with TikTok as they should. Uh, but in terms of the the recommended algorithm that caused so much trouble in like 20 in the earlier part of the last decade. To be fair to YouTube, they did fix a lot of that. It is much harder, I don't know if you guys noticed, it's a lot harder to get rabbit holed now in the same way that you could say two, three years ago where you go on YouTube looking for like, you know, I don't know, you know, a, an electric toothbrush and then you'd be like, suddenly you'd be in neo-Nazi land. Um, Have you guys noticed that? I'm curious. It's Yeah, they, they've done a lot of work on the recommended algorithm. Right. However, uh, all that content is still on platform, right? All the really harmful content is still there. Um, and it is alluring, it's captivating, and it will hold you on platform. So the sort of the argument that I have now is that it's not really an issue of algorithm anymore. Right. It's really an issue of business model. It's really a business issue. Like, I don't know, you guys in journalism, I'm sure have studied the Pulitzer Hearst fight of, I don't know, maybe you haven't. You should tell your teachers to talk to you about it of the late 1800s, um, which gave rise to the term yellow journalism, which referred to two huge publishing magnates that were sparring with each other over control of eyeballs. And the way that they did that was to pump out intentionally false global news stories in order to captivate viewers and make money. Um, so they were intentionally monetizing propaganda in order to outpace each other financially and gave rise to a term that basically means that your journalism is full of shit, right? Uh, for lack of a better way of putting it. That's what YouTube is. So we've been here before. We have been here before. And this has nothing to do with an algorithm. It's about making profit. And putting eyeballs, putting propaganda in front of a viewer is very alluring. And when you're doing it at 4.6 billion views a day, it's a lot of eyeballs and a lot of propaganda. And a lot of money, a lot of profit. So that's really the problem. Okay, so if I'm, I, I always think we live in systems, right? Systems of oppression, systems of manipulation with social media. So I always think, oh, I don't click on the ads, you know? I, 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 I'm safe, I'm, I'm gaming the algorithm. Clearly not, that's, you're no. saying no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, well one of the things I really appreciate about your film is that you showed us some of the positive, mm -hmm. you know, uh, aspects of YouTube. You know, people from marginalized communities finding each other, seeing yourself if you live in a remote area, right? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, dissident culture, right? 
Um, so I guess as well as you highlight a lot of the negative effects, so I guess I'm wondering, is there a way to address the negative effects without harming or removing the positive effects? I think so. Like, look, I wouldn't sit here and say that I have a, a, an ironclad solution for all of it because it's an extremely complicated issue. But there are solutions. There are myriad solutions, um, many of which YouTube knows perfectly well but would harm their, their bottom line uh, which, so they don't want to implement them. Uh, but I would argue, and I think that we go to great pains to show this in the film, the film itself is kind of the story that you just asked, right? It is about a guy, Caleb, who goes down a rabbit hole, back when those were more prominent, stays on platform, makes his way to Natalie Wynn in ContraPoints, and gets pulled out of this sort of downward spiral by this, this woman, this trans woman, who he doesn't know at all, who is on YouTube with a really large audience, providing incredibly great content, if you like her stuff, which I do very much. Um, a lot of the solution to these, the problems in these communities can be found in these communities. And that's why community has always been a driver for me and why I tell these stories, because they are communities. And I have a lot of problem with a kind of sort of satanic panic or reefer madness uh, hysteria about the internet and like get your kids off the phones like tell them to put their like sure I get it like there can be too much you can you can there are harms there you want to be able to monitor your use and all those things but they are at the end of the day where they're the landscapes that we inhabit and there's an enormous amount of benefit to those especially what we just went through with COVID where we literally lived on discord we lived on zoom that's where all of our interaction happens so uh, a lot of the time the community, as Natalie says in the movie herself, she didn't expect the corporation to come and fix this stuff, right? Uh, she didn't expect them to get bailed out, so they just roll up their sleeves and they start helping each other. And uh, so I think a lot of the solutions to the immediate harms can be found on platform. Okay. All right, I have some other questions, but I do want to open it up and we'll kind of go back and forth as an interplay. You guys have questions? about stuff we've been talking about and just questions that you had from the film. Don't be shy. Yes, in the back. Okay, hold on, there's a microphone coming. We're filming this. Hi, I was just wondering about when you're talking about how the TikTok algorithm is kind of a mess. I was just wondering about the difference of that versus YouTube. Like if YouTube makes money off of how long you spend on that and like taking your data and things like that, how does that differ from how TikTok monetizes their creators? It doesn't, I mean, the, word, the, the monetization is different in terms of how they, they do or don't pay creators. That's where there's a monetization difference. Uh, when I'm talking about the algorithm being wacko on, on TikTok, it, it's really mostly to do with the, the, the velocity, right? The amount of content you see and the amount of time that you see it. The, the business models are really similar. The idea of all these platforms are really similar, like including Facebook, right? It's, they're all basically ad-based models or they're based on holding you on platform as long as possible to content. And the TikTok content is very addictive. Like it is, it is so fast and so, its algorithm is so good at giving you the next little dopamine hit. Um, I say algorithmically, that's why I think this, this kind of stuff gets a little beyond algorithm. My point about TikTok's algorithm is it's just like, I mean, you, if you're on it, it's, you're kind of like, oh my God, right? It's, it's sort of a frenzy of, of stuff. Um, that's just the way the, tech, the UI itself works and the way what, what the, the end user's expectation is in terms of their inner relationship with that platform. They know they're gonna get super fast, super intense content and probably rifle through quite a bit. A lot of people on YouTube are using it like TV um, they'll sit and watch one person for a half an hour. You know, they won't, it will be a little less of that continual rifling. I mean, it happens, but it's not as common just due to how long the videos are and how much sort of disparate content there is. So that's all I meant. I mean, from a money-making standpoint, they're very similar. YouTube is just way bigger, so it makes way more money. So other questions before we go into systemic policies and such? Yes. One sec, sorry, wait for the microphone. Thank you. I don't know if this is germane to this topic, but do you think there's a way to encourage YouTube to just in have something, instead of an ad every time between videos, put something every now and then that's l that encourages empathy 
<laughs> in a way that the old like Saturday morning shows every now and then you'd see like a educational. Video there's a lot of thought in this area. It's a very good question. There's a lot of thought and there's a lot of people working on that right now in a bunch of different areas, both within the company and influencers and other people who are driving uh, new content to YouTube. Um, and also there are a lot of influencers like Natalie and other people who aren't like Natalie who are doing trying to counteract um, some of the negatives. Uh, I think that the, and I think all of those solutions are, val are valuable and will we'll have benefit for sure. So I wouldn't negate any of them. I think my fear right now is the monetized concerted push towards harmful propaganda and, and sort of uh, violent inciting hate speech. So not just calling someone na a name, but actually calling for their death which is happening. And doxing them with their address. Well, do, I mean, specifically doxing an individual, but also calling out entire groups of people and, 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 and demanding that they be killed on site or things like that, which has real world implications. But like, I think what's going on with PragerU in Florida right now, where the government is mandating and allowing PragerU to be used in schools, which is a complete propaganda YouTube channel that is literally just fuels disinformation uh, and anti-fact with a very specific political agenda that is very heavily funded, that's the, that has to get regulated at some point. There has to be law protecting kids from that kind of material. So that is really intriguing what you're saying. Uh, like it's like PSAs in a way. There's a, such an, a chilling quote, I forget the man's name who got unpilled. Uh, Caleb. Caleb. Yeah. So when he says, you know, um, that he, that it was killing his empathy and turning him into a sociopath. Yeah. So well, I mean, we that's that? that's how you make an army of fascists, right? I mean, that's literally that's no different from, you know, what the Nazis were doing. It's it's methodical, um, and unfortunately, you know, YouTube is a is an unwitting uh, aid in the dissemination of that and the building of those kinds of of communities. Because unwitting it, or witting. Well, unwitting to the degree that they don't they don't share that value system, mm -hmm. but they are profiting off of the that content. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Well, let's we'll take more questions, but let's get into so um, systemically, what are our solutions? What kind of guardrails do you advocate for? Look, I think that there's a lot of similarity between the automobile and and the laws around the automobile and the fight from the automotive companies uh, and what's going on in big tech. Um, and you can get into a lot of arguments with people. As so and look, I'm actually tech agnostic. I'm like more of a pro-tech person than an anti-tech person. Um, so a lot of the, the crowd that I'm with are very pro-privacy, anti-surveillance, you know, uh, pro-citizens' rights, anti-too much, um, uh, sort of regulation that would actually kill the internet. I'm very concerned about laws that are being put forward uh, in the EU and the UK and some here in the US that are aimed at fixing the internet or protecting kids but will actually make kids much more vulnerable and make the LGBTQ community more vulnerable, make everybody who is vulnerable more vulnerable. So I have to caveat like whenever I talk about regulation with the fact that a lot of the regulation that's being floated right now is terrible and will actually make things worse for the average citizen and much more empowering for big tech. It will have the inverse uh, uh, effect of Could what- give, give us an example? Um, there's a, there's a uh, the online safety bill in the UK right now, um, which is being floated around is, um, and the COSA bill, the, the, the sort of child safety bill that's being perpetually shot down and then revived here in the US um, a lot of the, what's baked into those laws is, is uh, de-anonymizing the end user, uh, forcing you to give your information, your driver's license, your birth certificate, your age, your name. Uh, you can imagine what that leads to. Um, it's, it gets into uh, uh, creating uh, sort of standards for content that could easily be misused by bad actors. Um, it puts a lot of information online that can get misused by hackers. And these things are already happening. So it's not like some kind of fear-mongering uh, caveat to prevent laws from, from being put in place. It is, they will be abused. 
and they will be abused by autocracies and far-right governments and, and people who will target uh, the marginalized and the not so marginalized. Like what we're, we're seeing with, with, with Musk on Twitter, you know, he went from, you know, attacking the trans community to just brazenly attacking the entire Jewish community within the, sp the space of a couple months. Like, it, you know, there's no end to that. And if you give that somebody like that an enormous amount of power and then the levers of control on law, um, it's very, very, very dangerous. So these things are not easy to legislate. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not legislatable. It just means that they have to be, laws have to be crafted by people probably like you who actually understand how the internet works, which unfortunately in government is not a lot of who you're dealing with. They don't really understand the internet. They're just very angry, which I understand, and they wanna do something, which I also understand. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the point is you gotta do the right thing. Um, so I think long-term breaking up um, these companies so they're not so big. So anti-monopoly law that is targeted, laws that are targeted at um, uh, accountability. We were talking about this earlier. This is what happened with the automotive industry. Eventually they had to put seat belts in cars. They really didn't want to do that, even though people were dying at, at a crazy rate. Uh, but eventually they had to. They were just pressured so much by citizens and government that they put seat belts in the damn cars. We need guardrails like that online and you say that and a lot of people get very angry and freaked out um, but we do okay I'm curious how many people in here think that uh, YouTube needs any guardrails okay how many people that's almost everyone for are, are there, are there <laughs> some in here that feel that, that it, we should not have guardrails that okay or no one that's brave enough to <laughs> raise their hand okay fair enough um, so Okay, so anti-monopoly. Okay, so here's another question. So I think I had a quote from you. So, hold on one sec. Right, so that these platforms play on rage and anger and drama and they, and they, they build in profit incentives, right? So there are ways you could probably tamp with that, but like what do we do about the human nature problem? Y you know, we're, we're drawn to that, right? We can, sure. we can scale down the algorithm, but how do we deal with that? I mean, the fact is, is that there's a lot of room for freedom and privacy and safety online. There's a lot of room for that and some law. There just is. It's a free for all right now. And the the rise of sort of anti-democratic uh, governments around the world is taking great advantage of the complete lack of basic standards and practices online. The COSA bill, the one I was just talking about here in the US that's supposedly gonna protect kids, the far right is salivating for that to get passed. So they've been very brazen about the fact that if that law passes, they will immediately use it to attack uh, abortion rights advocates. They will immediately use it to censor any type of material online that helps people who are trying to get reproductive rights, women. They will immediately use it to target LGBTQ I mean, that is like gravy for an autocratic government. Um, and they're open about it because they're dealing with such kind of clumsy, thick-headed, misguided lawmaking on the one hand that no one's paying attention to them. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of disturbing. Um, so I think that, that the human nature element is not going to change the, 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 the fact that we're fighting you know, 40-year-old reproductive right battles again, the fact that we're fighting 40, 50, 60-year-old civil rights battles again, when most of us of my age didn't think we were going to be, tells you, unfortunately, that it isn't really that simple right. and that you don't get to stop fighting, right? Like, you have to get involved. The, the issue I have with my generation around the Internet is that they have a very, largely, it's a generalization, a very patronizing kind of dismissive attitude towards technology where they're like, it's just bad, just tell your kids they can't use, they, they're on this stuff too much, we did just fine without Instagram, and it's like, that's not gonna help anything, right? The reality is, is the inverse. The reality is, is like, technology is just an evolution of all of human thinking, the good, the bad, and in between, it's just kind of part of who we are. It isn't separate from who we are. 
and we, it's really on kind of all of us to have some degree of involvement in terms of shaping how these communities work moving forward and what we will and won't allow, just like it's on all of us to deal with climate change, just like it's on all of us to deal with like getting abortion rights back. Like it's on all of us to make these things happen because we see what happens if we don't take action. These, these rights go away, our world becomes less safe. Okay, um, I'm ready to sign up. Whatever you're doing, I'm ready <laughs> to sign up. Okay, we have public policy here, journalism people here, you know, uh, other from other disciplines. So I think let's segue into what can we do, right? So I think, you know, we, we've learned, like you said, we've learned you can't legislate human nature away. We can't legislate racism away. It doesn't work. Maybe it suppresses the expression of it, right? So um, so this is, this is a center for uh, communication policy, right, and leadership. So do you guys have questions or ideas about what communications folks can do? I know it's Monday night, but. <laughs> well, Alex, do you have ideas? Maybe you'll stimulate some ideas for them. Uh, look, the, the beginning is to, is to understand how these systems work. Um, the, the beginning is to, is to keep your eye on what laws are being written and who's writing them. Because they're all actually really, really, for the most part, good-hearted people that you can talk to. Um, and, so, and so getting involved in everything from just like the most basic of just writing your rep or your congressman or talking to your professors or whoever um, to actually working on policy or working on technology or working on journalism um, or working on apps or making films or whatever your, uh, you know, your little avenue of interest is, all of that is going to make a huge difference. Because really awareness, like the thing that I do find somewhat reassuring, and we dealt with this a lot when we were working on the film, is there is such thing as truth, right? <laughs> um, the, you know, I don't want to offend anyone here who's a flat earther, but you know, the earth isn't flat. Right? It's a fact that it's not. So um, there's a starting point that, that you can aim yourself towards. And it's kind of a propaganda agenda to sort of to divide people between fact and non-fact and sort of to get people sort of into a space where they're questioning everything. Uh, without actually just doing the work of learning what the facts are. That's like the, the big, you know, the parody of Joe Rogan, I think, these days now is like, he'll just make some grand claim and they'll, someone on his show will be like, well, is that true? He's like, well, I don't know, look it up. They'll look it up and it's like, and it's not true, right? Like nine times out of ten, it's just complete nonsense. So, I mean, you can actually find facts, right? So, I think that you can start with the truth and you can question, you know, someone who is aiming you at something that seems off. Um, and I think that's actually fundamentally a really important thing. I think that, that countering the sort of the anti-science, anti-fact kind of propaganda machine that is really in full force right now. And I'll tell you, I mean, heading into 2024 election is going to be, it's going to be crazy town for the next two years. So it's really going to be an interesting test for a lot of you folks. And I'm sure, like, I've got a kid in middle school, uh, 14, he's really smart. And when Andrew Tate got arrested, um, I went to him and I was like, and you know, I'm around him enough to know he's not black pill, but I was like, you know, what do you think about Andrew Tate? He's like, well, you know, at first I thought maybe he was kind of cool, then I kind of quickly realized he was bad news, and now I realize he's actually like a terrible, violent criminal, <laughs> right? Um, I was like, okay, but what about your friends? He's like, well, I'd say probably two thirds of my friends at school think he's cool. Oh. And I was like, even after the arrest, I was like, yeah, they don't believe it. They think the charges are not true. And, you know, this is like <laughs> regular school, right? And uh, so that's what we're up against. And I think that you probably all have friends or you've gone through it yourself. Like we've all gone through like our own sort of rabbit hole where we start to question and question and question. I've done it as a doc filmmaker. I've gone down like some really intense rabbit holes and then go, wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on a second. Like where am I? Like I've sort of left the reservation, right? Like I've gone off into the la la land. I've got to reel myself back. So it's not hard to have that happen to you. So I think we all have to be kind of grounded to, to facts as much as we can. I think another aspect I think it's really important is media literacy. 
which is recognized, you know, as a filmmaker, I make documentary films. So the idea that I can't trust what I'm seeing, it feels like an existential crisis for a filmmaker, for, for a country, for a culture. And you will be democracy. exploited. I mean, you will absolutely be exploited. There are people just waiting for you to jump on that bandwagon so that they can take you on their journey to where they want you to go. And that's what the internet is very good at doing. It's very good at weaponizing communities, which is what happened with Gamergate. Gamergate took a bunch of very kind of disenfranchised, mostly white young males, and for the first time, it actually connected them with a very specific political agenda and created a little army that took us all the way to the Proud Boys and the insurrection of January 6. Um, so there is a consequence to to that kind of indoctrination. So how do we how do we resist that? So we, you know you're talking about legislating. I think that there are ways for journalists and and citizens to okay call our elected representatives, educate ourselves, watch these films. But how do we resist when we don't even know if what we're watching is true or not? Because I do think that. I would argue that we do, we do have ways of determining what is true. Like if you watch PragerU, which presents itself as an educational tool, and they start talking about slavery, and they start talking about how the slaves were actually happy, and the slaves wanted to be slaves. That's in the schools? That's, that, that's their anti-fact anti propaganda about white supremacy, which is what drives Prager, is white supremacy. It's a white supremacist uh, institution, essentially. So, you know, that's a non-fact, right? So <laughs> I think that, that, that it's, I don't actually have the same total terror that some people do right now, that there's going to be no way to have attribution. There's going to be no way to know what is and isn't real. AI is going to be so good that you're not going to know, you know, I mean, sure, you're going to get robocalled by your mom, maybe, and, <laughs> and then realize it's not your mom. But, uh, but most of that stuff is, is pretty easy to, to navigate. And uh, I don't have the same level of, of fear there. Um, but I do think it takes engagement and not passivity. Right. I think that it does take saying, if I don't keep an eye on the world in which I live, the technology in which I live, the community on, online in which I operate, the companies that run those, the government that are fighting, that are creating laws against them, if I'm not a little bit aware of that, it doesn't take a lot of work, a little bit of that, then we will end up in a much worse world. Can you talk a little about uh, your process in coming up with this idea and how it morphed over time? And like, uh, did you have a you know, preliminary thesis statement when you started in 2020? And did you have like a red team saying, you know, that you had to pitch it to? And uh, yeah. Can you talk about that? Sure. I mean, I'll keep it brief too. But, um, you know, the fun thing about making documentaries is that you really start you should, in my opinion, start with a pretty blank page, right? Like, I don't know everything about the topic. If I did, I'd, I'd have no interest in it. So I usually start a documentary with awareness of my, of my topic, but with very, very um, unsolvable questions that I, that I want to get, either, if not answered, at least investigate and interrogate. Uh, and so with this, I certainly knew that YouTube had a massive foothold on the planet. Um, I knew that I generally, generally liked YouTube. I didn't come at it with a negative opinion coming in. Um, I felt like they had done a lot of good. I felt like they drove a lot of the diversity initiatives that ended up in Hollywood had originated on YouTube. And intentionally, like they wanted to give voice to different people. Um, but I started learning things pretty quickly. <laughs> and they drove the direction of the story. Um, I, I learned pretty early on that YouTube is kind of a, is kind of a front and that is presented as a separate company from Google, which is the largest, really the largest company on the planet, certainly the largest tech company on the planet in terms of, of its engagement with the, the, its populace. More people use Google products than anything else in terms of how they engage with it than an Apple product. Um, Google, YouTube is really Google's media front end. That's a pretty heavy thing when you're dealing with a giant tech monopoly that's profit is larger than the GDP of most countries, right? Um, so that began to shape what our story was. That shaped the questions I was asking people. That shaped the questions I was asking Susan Wojcicki or Steve Chen or people who actually worked there. Um, and then I started to really dig into some not so easy to find stats about YouTube's responsibility um, in terms of, I knew about Christchurch shooting, that was the big seminal 
terrible thing YouTube did that we all knew was YouTube's fault back in 2019. Do you guys uh, know what that is? Does anyone? That was in the movie. It's the New Zealand. It's when 52 Muslim people were murdered in Christchurch, New Zealand, by a very terrible human being who wrote a manifesto, basically talking about two to three YouTube influencers that had pr uh, prompted him to commit this crime. Um, which, to YouTube's credit, they did deplatform Stefan Molyneux, and, and but it was too late. And there were other killings that happened as a result of that type of content. Uh, but it became clear as I was in the middle of COVID how much of disinf medical disinformation YouTube was driving that was killing a lot of people uh, and how much uh, they were responsible ultimately, I would say largely of all the tech companies, primarily responsible for the Jan 6 insurrection. So, um, which is the weaponizing of a community, you know, against a bunch of innocent people. However, wherever you side politically, that's what happened, right? So, um, so those shaped our story and the direction that we went. And the film could have gone in a few different directions, but the way I tend to make movies, I don't ever like make a film about YouTube going, we're gonna tell the whole YouTube, like, it's impossible, right? Like, I knew I would have to drill down. And so I seek a small ensemble of characters always in my docs. Like, I don't like wall after wall after wall of talking heads, experts. Um, I'd rather watch the news. So I usually seek out a very small collection of, of people who I care about and who I feel are interconnected and human and f vulnerable and will express like the heart of these issues. Um, and that's what I saw it. And they shaped the story, right? Because I'm talking to Natalie and I'm talking to Caleb and they're in different sides of the world. And I realize like, oh, holy shit, Natalie saved this guy's life. And it's like, everybody's connected. And like, Carrie's connected to Andy Parker, who's connected to Caleb, who's connected to Brianna. Like, it was an amazing kind of web that started to form from all these dis disparate people. Um, and that drives the story. So that's kind of how, that's the organic flow of which a doc, the docs we make work. They're usually made with a small group of people and that sort of, you know, that and the circumstances end up dictating what road you go down. We don't have, like Gail Ann Hurd, the really great producer, worked on the film, uh, collaborated with us. She had brought the idea to me. Um, but there was nobody who was sort of driving what direction we went and saying you have to do this or you have to do that. So we were free. And I'm not disingenuous with my subject. So I didn't, I told Susan what movie we were making, you know, the CEO of YouTube. I mean, I have a lot of respect for her. So I was like, these are the questions I'm going to ask you. This is what we're making. Um, it's not all positive, you know, but it's not a takedown either. And we're just, you're just transparent. And then you get, as we talked about, you get truthful, answers that actually convey a lot, even if they don't tell you everything. <laughs> well put. Um, <laughs> other questions? Or do we need to wrap up? We need to wrap up. OK. OK. You guys are awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so stay, stay aware. Thank you so much for making this film. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Thanks for coming out. Thanks to all of you. I appreciate you being here. I really learned a lot from your film, <laughs> since I'm not a big YouTuber. I hope you sleep well. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you both uh, for the great conversation and, and the great movie. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, you can stay up to date on CCLP events on our website. Uh, and I believe the YouTube Effect is streaming. It is. Uh, pretty so much everywhere, uh, including